There's a young sister, Melody Jones, who is now the director of the Katie Cannon Center at Virginia U. And she did a presentation on the slave factor, um, introducing what, you know, the, the nuances of Beyonce's um, words, meaning, you know, about what does it take for black women, you know, to, to slay, you know, to, to be all that they're supposed to do using a womanist ethics. And that's another piece that I, I write about and, and live into. What does it mean to be a, a womanist? Let's be responsible, you know, um, to be inclusive, all of that. That's what it means uh, to love oneself regardless. And so to, to love ourselves as African-American Lutheran women in this church, you know, we slay. When I felt the call, it didn't seem like there would be any barriers. I didn't expect there to be any problems or hiccups or hangups. Um, maybe I was a little naive, but it, it made it such that I just thought, well, anybody, you know, if they have that call on their life, anybody could do that. And in fact, it was at the age of nine that I preached my first sermon here. And that's how we were. We were the children. We could do that. Earlene sat me down in her office and said, oh, yeah, sure, absolutely, Cece could preach a sermon. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> How Prince of Peace came about when the uh, LCA at that particular time decided that they felt like there needed to be an intentional attempt to have ministry in African American uh, communities and to reach out to uh, African Americans. Prior to that, there had been a number of things that had been taking place here in North Carolina. I think what she brought to us was more of a, a centering and nurturing our leadership, our lay leadership. I feel each pastor brought something different to our growth as a church. And Earlene brought a calmness, because this was the 70s, man. We were how old? <laughs> In our 20s and, and just, you know, had Stuff our kids. Things yes. were popping off, yeah. Yes. And so we were learning all about being a Lutheran and yes. saying, okay, wow. You know, so, and so we had that energy going. When, but when Earlene came, there was a, um, a maturity and a calming and a focus into who we were as adults who were learning and continuing to grow in our Lutheran faith. What Prince of Peace is all about, this particular community was came about because of urban renewal. A lot of in this particular area, which is Warnersville, had been a thriving African American community, uh, still is, but it had a lot of businesses, the school. We had more kids here than that was at the rec center just up the street here. And so that was a primary focus. When we first organized uh, uh, a larger percentage of Prince of Peace were children, children and youth, and we had adults here. But the whole focus was to be an outreach. We were a center for service. I was hired here as a youth worker back in 1971. Some of the focus has changed uh, from what we originally had because as we grew older, we uh, wanted to uh, become looking inward to see and to help develop who we are 
as a congregation, spiritually. Paul liberates all of them because we serve a God who is full of mercy and grace, and that's why Jesus came. Not to divide us. I'm convinced that just like the first time Jesus came, everybody was surprised. Y'all will be surprised. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you're going to go back in. All right, see you later. She's taking my mom and dialysis. One of the things that Prince of Peace always was, was unto itself. It was honest about who it was. When Erlene came in, she taught us that, that we needed to honor um, the tradition that we were a part of, not succumb to it but to honor it and be knowledgeable about it. So we got the LBW when it came out and um, learned how to be a part of the, the youth movement across the Synod and to go into that in a way that where our voices were clear and heard. Our choirs were often invited to different events. And what we wanted to make sure was that we weren't coming as a minstrel show. We were coming to share the gospel in a new and prophetic way. And Erlene helped us to realize how we can do that. How can we be authentically African and go in and speak the dual language in such a way that we could be heard and not looked upon as someone that was inauthentic in our Lutheranism. So Erlene came to Prince of Peace when I was nine. And because I had grown up in, in that posture, that understanding of individuals being unique and them having talent, it didn't surprise me. I didn't know we were making history when Erlene became a part of who we are were. This is the Griffins. See, it still says Griffins out there. And they're one of the families that have helped to um, keep the community banded together. Uh, with UNCG growing and sprawling all over this community, they've been trying to buy up things. And um, they, they're one of the ones that spearheaded the movement not to do that. So this is the pool where I learned to swim. And this is the community center. Uh, it has now become a part of the school system so that the community centers um, playground is now used by the school. This is David E. Jones back here. And this was a big deal when this happened. Oh yeah. yeah this was and so deal. I was yeah. nine years old and she began to um, meet with me and talk with me and, and do different things with the, the whole group of us who were part of that. And so it wasn't, it wasn't anything unusual to me. This is just, yeah, well, why wouldn't she be? And allow her to, to be able to give to us in the different way, in a new way. She came in and her vocabulary was ridiculous. Every word that she used in her sermon seemed to be 15 to 16 letters long. So it gave us a deep appreciation, not only for her Africanness, but her education level as well. And it challenged us in a way to, to really think about our theology in a way that, that was not only from the things we experienced, but from the things that we read and saw within the Lutheran Church and also outside of it. I know that if I had not seen Erlene, I would not have been able to easily imagine myself in her role. We had some really great pastors that served here and they embraced us and it was truly the priesthood of all believers. But I, I having had her as an um, unknown model to me, it just changed my whole outlook on things. My whole mindset was different because I could imagine, I could see her, myself in her. It's one of the things that I often uplift about being African, is that there's no separation. So Erlene's achievement are my achievements. You know, when, when something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. It's a communal thing. So Erlene doing that, I didn't know how much of a trendsetter and trailblazer she was, but it did show me that this is possible. And so, her legacy lives on here at Prince of Peace because we don't know how to not celebrate our ancestors and the things that have gone on before us. We're always looking for a reason.
People have told me stop saying um. Well, what are they now? You should be here. Okay, well, you're great. Um, so as an African-American woman in the Lutheran Church, um, I feel I have a dual call. And as a mission developer in West Charlotte, I am directly serving a primarily African-American congregation. I also serve, I feel, within the African Descent Strategy team. That call is something different. That is being sent out. But if I'm gonna be completely honest, part of it is a call that I feel like Christ has positioned me in this place at this time. But part of it is I have a PhD and a degree from Chapel Hill and Duke. And it has opened doors and gained attention that I don't know as just a young black woman, I would get alone. I think one of the issues is the fact that our congregations, our Lutheran congregations, assume that we're newcomers to the endeavor. We've been here for quite some time. The fact that we've been doing this work in ways that are not necessarily Lutheran legacy kinds of, of ways, it's, 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 still, it's still striking to me. Who did Luther learn from? Augustine, you know, who was an African, yeah. And so the history of that often is truncated and, um, and that's the sad part. And we've been doing as a synod this uh, transforming white privilege. I found that letter from my mom um, after she died that uh, was from my great-great-grandfather to his family back home. Very, very deeply moving. God's gonna take care of you. It's almost like a sermon. And then just as matter-of-fact as you please, like I'm talking to you right now, he said, and so uh, when I don't come back, I need you to sell two of the six horses, take the $250 we had saved, go to Concord and buy a slave. And then just went on with the rest of his letter. My privilege piece used to be up here, but my privilege piece moved down here. Cause I'm like, this is me. I mean, what I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like a carrier. It's a very humbling and embarrassing and um, convicting kind of a thing. You've already heard in the grant from the And since family. I also happen to be a bishop, um, and because our church is so convicted on a church-wide level, then, you know, trying to translate that into what we're about here in the North Carolina Synod too. And then to lift up and go to worship last night where I look up at the altar and it's just African-American women who are presiding and doing all of that. And uh, it, was, uh, it was so wonderful, uh, kind of redemptive. The church is changing, the world is changing for the better. I personally love the diversity. I've embraced it. Yes, we have gone through growing pains, We've gone through identity crisis. We've gone, even as a small church, we've gone through a lot. And, but I say, something is happening here. You know, God's got us here for a reason. For the sake of the gospel, I would risk everything. I would rather be naked on the curb in the street, beaten, bruised, and battered, and doing the right thing for God than to disobey God and hold my tongue when God has given me the opportunity and the words to say that would help people, help people, help people look inside of themselves and recognize the places where they are doing wrong that's hurting and stopping the gospel because I think that's really what we're doing. We're limiting what God can do by having a limited mindset. Speaking truth to power in a system that is political was scary for me initially. It wasn't scary for me in that I was afraid of the things, the repercussions that might come upon me as a person, but would I be able to consider, con continue to serve a church when I am being critical of it? 
I wondered whether that would be possible, and now I just don't care. I, I'm going to speak the truth. Um, I'm going to call out situations that are unfair and unjust, and the Lord keeps providing me with allies and accomplices who get it, who say, yes, let's be a part of that. Let's change the world. Why don't we?